My name is Seth Harris, and I'm going to walk you through the technical process of composing this oil painting step by step. I should warn you that I'm going to talk a lot, and that may not be your thing. If so, you can skip to the two minute mark and turn the sound off. This is the second video of a two part mini series. Part one showed a painting composed on top of a chalk underdrawing. This video shows a painting composed more organically without the use of an underdrawing. Before I started painting, though, I had an idea. I wanted to create a painting of my friend Andrew wearing a necktie or a bow tie. I scheduled a photo shoot with him in Prospect Park. The rain was just tapering off as the shoot started, so we went with it and took some pictures with an umbrella. This one ended up being my favorite. The only edit that I wanted to make in the painted rendition is that I wanted to replace the light space with a dark background and hopefully indicate some rain. Now I prefer to paint on an artist grade canvas that has a 7 8 inch stretcher. I might consider using a thicker stretcher, but I currently don't have the storage space in my studio. Most pre-stretched canvases come surface white, but I never paint on a white canvas. I always coat my canvases with some form of black or darkened gesso. In this case, I'm using black acrylic gesso, which dries quickly to a matte surface. Just make sure you wait 24 hours before you use it to paint. These are the pigments that I use for the painting. I show you this because I want to be clear on exactly what paints I use, as it is important. Here's a list of those pigments. Uh, hopefully this is more readable. If you watched my last video, you saw me create a detailed reference drawing and underpainting. The process in this painting short circuits that step and goes right into the underpainting. This technique is very useful when drawing or painting from life. Now to be clear, I'm not painting from life, obviously. My reference is an image on a nearby laptop computer. But this method of composing is important if you're ever going to paint on the fly. Essentially, you pick a point. Here, it's the model's left eye. Then you scale the rest of the painting around this one spot. The location of all the other features are placed relative to this one single point. When I'm in a figure drawing class, this is how I work most of the time. I've mixed burnt umber, burnt sienna, and cadmium red to get the underpainting color for the bow tie. Technically, the color of the tie is also a departure from the photograph. I change the colors of fabric so much that I often forget that I've done it. The dress shirt is flake white replacement with a little Mars black added later. I make it a point to get the lighter pigment down first before darkening. Sometimes I even wait to add the detail for this color in the second layer of paint. The skin tone for this painting is a mix of six colors. Flake white replacement, blush, burnt sienna, burnt umber, Mars black, and a tiny bit of cadmium red. This brush has a really small amount of Mars black with the flake white replacement. It's mostly flake white replacement, probably 95% white pigment to get this shadow detail on the collar. Now I'm going to start the underpainting of the jacket with what's left of the burnt sienna and burnt umber. Also, I'm going to add Mars black to get some details in the hair and in the tie. Sometimes when I'm underpainting, I just throw down a bunch of paint and hope it comes out with a texture that I like when I return to the piece a few days later. One of the things that I love to do in a painting is find a space where I can brush in some heavy texture and push a sort of dreamlike quality. Tweed fabric already has so much texture that I thought it would be the perfect place to keep the surface rough and underdeveloped. Now when you portray someone in a painting, it's easy to feel confined by what's in the reference material. It's easy to fall in the trap of feeling that your painting is only good if it's accurate. I think that accuracy is boring. I mean, we have cameras for accuracy, but a good photographer is never consistently accurate. There's always manipulation, and it's manipulation for the sake of improvement, which is how it should be. That's why it's art. I want viewers to see my work like it's a dream or a memory that they've had, which is why some parts of this painting are gonna be precise and sharp, and others will be dull and shapeless. As an artist, you need to make decisions about what's going to be accurate and what's not. When you spend too much time working on a piece, you may not be able to see inaccuracies anymore. 
That's why it's a good idea to spread out the time that you take working on a painting. In the video here, I'm on my second day of underpainting. I've had some distance from the piece, a few days. Because of this, I'm able to make improvements that I can only make with fresh eyes. Instead of getting frustrated with areas that you don't like, give yourself distance. There's no need to rush. Give yourself a few months, work on another piece, or two, or three. I usually have four to six pieces going at any given time. When I come back to a painting that I've set aside for a few weeks, I usually know pretty quickly what needs attention. If you don't have the luxury of time, then look at the painting in a mirror. It will reset your perspective. Or take a digital photo. Those always look different. On an unrelated note, I find that using multiple brushes throughout a painting will save time and reduce the pigment and solvent waste. Throughout a piece, I will typically have a brush dedicated to light and dark skin tone. Also, white, another for black, and then one for red or orange or yellow or other strong colors. Now, you're about to see me make a mistake that happens quite often when you start a painting without an underdrawing. It's tough to see because part of it's off camera, but I'm about to place the book in the wrong spot. Now, I don't realize it until later when I further develop the piece and I see that the placement just doesn't work, but it's not a problem. This is oil painting. You can just paint over it. Uh, there you see it just over in the corner. I'll paint over it later. Now I'm ready to mix my glazing medium. I'm using an eyedropper to control the ratios. This is a mixture of two liquids. One will be a fattening oil, which will increase gloss, and the other will be a lean solvent, which will decrease gloss. The oil that I'm using is called drying poppy oil, and my lean solvent is called odorless mineral spirits. The glazing medium is brushed onto the area that you intend to paint. If you use too much glazing medium, you can wipe it off with a clean rag. The ratio to fattening oil and lean solvent will change throughout a painting for a variety of reasons. The first glaze here was on the lean side, with 60% poppy oil and 40% mineral spirits. Essentially, I spent the next 10 or 15 studio hours glazing additional layers. Here you can see me correcting the book placement and adding details with the model's left hand. Remember, as you add overlapping layers, to increase a percentage of drying poppy oil and decrease a percentage of odorless mineral spirits. Another way of saying this is that the medium should be increasingly fat and decreasingly lean. Here I added the details of the umbrella and made some miscellaneous corrections. A few more hours of layering though, and you begin to run out of things to correct. At this point, I'm satisfied with the piece and ready to add a date and signature. It's good to wait a few months before you varnish. I'm using Gambar, which says you don't need to, but I'm not in a rush. Make sure you clean the piece before varnishing. I used a clean rag with some odorless mineral spirits. Once the piece dried, I applied two coats of varnish. Well, that's the video. Thank you for staying awake. Or if you used it to help you sleep, thank you for sleeping.